New Year's Eve, 1967. Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas, Nevada. The toughest competitor that anyone ever has to face in life is death. And death was my competitor. I wanted to get on the motorcycle and go against death. Wild turkey, straight up. Robert Craig Knievel begins his transformation to become the most famous daredevil on the planet. It is the jump that made Evil Knievel famous. But half a century later, the question still remains. Why did he crash? The Caesars opened in 1966. It was Jay Sarno built the place and really publicized this new idea of these spectacular hotels in Las Vegas. When Caesars Palace opened up in 1966, overnight, all the high rollers came down here. This is a Frank Sinatra comes down. All the big entertainers are here. In the summer of 1967, an unknown stunt performer named Evil Knievel sees the brand new Caesars Palace for the first time. To get in on the action, Knievel decides he must jump the fountains in front of the new hotel. He calls the owner, Jay Sarno. Sarno? Hello, Gary Lang from the Esquire magazine. I, I heard about this guy, uh, Evil Knievel. Never heard of him. Evil Knievel, everyone's talking about him. Says he's gonna jump the fountains at your casino there. <laughs> I'd like to know where you heard that story from, pal. The first time Evil calls Jay Sarno, Jay tells him to get lost. I don't have time for this, you know, I don't know who you are. Yeah, yeah, right. You're dreaming, pal. Don't waste my time. Evil then creates these different personas. Who's this guy named Evil Neville? I hear he's going to jump over your fountains on a motorcycle. When's who doing what? What are you talking about? Are you crazy? You don't waste my time. And he made up names. Hello, this is Ben Buckley. Neville Knevel? Awful Knevel, you heard about him. And he was doing different accents, too. Hello, this is Austin State. What do you, what do you want? Neville Knevel. He's gonna make you famous. Jesus. He portrayed himself as a promoter, as a journalist. He made up aliases, Frank Rosenstein, and Evel Neville, Neville, Evil Neville, all these things that he used to say, just to get a meeting with Jay Sarno. Sarno. Then all of a sudden, these media outlets start calling Caesar's Palace saying, when is this jump going to happen? We're going to send a correspondent. Okay, you're the third guy's called about this. He wants to jump my fountain. And it worked. And uh, they bought into it. Jay is now seeing dollar signs. Hey, Betty, get a hold of some guy called Evil Knievel. This is getting a lot of attention. Have him come in and see me. I want to meet this guy so he can jump over my fountains. And that's literally how it happened. So Jay Sarno was the kind of guy who really liked to make an impact, and he really carried that over into every detail, including the entertainment. So you're this evil Knievel guy I've been hearing about. I've done some jumps recently, and people have been talking. <laughs> Wait a minute. What? That's your voice I heard on the phone. You called me all those times. Not all those times. Knievel fits perfectly into Sarno's plan to make Caesars an entertainment capital. Okay, listen, what do you got? What do you got? I've written up the plans myself. Those are your fountains. That's ramp one, ramp two. You got people all over this, everywhere you can fit. Okay, how many people? How many, how many, how many people? As many as you can get in. Okay. In thousands, you hold on. Thousands. And attention on your casino. Even more money. All right. You are now talking my language. I think we could do some business together. Thank you, Mr. Sarno. Cheers. To our business, we're going to make some money. A friendship is born that is destined to last a lifetime. Jay and Evil, they just hit it off. They were both really high stakes gamblers in every sense of the term. And they just had a huge bromance, as they would say today. 
The jump date is set for New Year's Eve, 1967. To do it, Knievel plans to place two wooden ramps 141 feet apart on either side of the fountain. It is to be the longest jump any stunt rider has ever attempted. Knievel's motorcycle for this deadly jump is a Triumph Bonneville, a British-made 650cc bike painted red, white, and blue. The Evil Knievel Museum in Topeka, Kansas, houses the largest collection of Evil Knievel memorabilia in the world. This is an exact recreation of the Caesars Palace bike, the 1967 Bonneville Triumph, and basically done up like Evil had it, same paint job. Um, but we want people to see exactly what this guy was launching that great distances with on these basically stock motorcycles. And that was kind of the, the thing about Evil. These weren't trick bikes. You know, suspension wasn't increased or anything. He was just jumping on normal street bikes that anybody could go out and buy. And that's unreal. Come up from over there. Knievel takes what little money he has and hires a camera crew to film his stunt. And they are not an ordinary crew. John Derrick is a matinee idol turned director, and his girlfriend, Linda Evans, is an actress destined to become a household name on the primetime soap dynasty. So I'll go over there. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm probably going to go somewhere over here. Okay, I'm going to stand over here if you okay. want. The film that was shot of the Caesars Palace jump has been said by a lot of people who are in the film business to be one of the greatest pieces of film footage ever filmed. This was filmed by one of the most beautiful blondes. Her name is Linda Evans. You know, that's always convinced me that I know more about beautiful women than other guys do because it took the rest of the men in America almost 15 or 20 years to wake up to how beautiful Linda Evans really is. 5 p.m. The time has come. Knievel gives the crowd a thrill with a few wheelies, his engine roaring over their baffled murmurs. We're doing it! Yeah! <laughs> hey, we're all right up there! Here's a guy in a cape. Here, here's a, a Superman guy. This is his cape he actually wore around. I mean, who thinks of stuff like that? The stuff he did was real. It wasn't some Hollywood production BS movie. It w he was a real superhero, and he did real death-defying things. So that, that, that's why we're standing here talking about him 50 years later. Evil's crash happens so fast and is so violent that there is no time to ask the question, what went wrong? Evil Knievel is the fountain of youth. Let's go! The 
it's, it's a deep inspiration for every person needs to find that within themselves to be a hero for themselves, for their family, for anybody, just to go for it in life. Not just to exist, but to, to live, truly live your life. And that's what he embodied, to go for it. He was the face of individuality, if there ever was one. Decoding the legend of Evil Knievel begins by understanding the man who created him. Robert Craig Knievel is born in 1938 in Butte, Montana. His parents split when he is just a toddler and he is raised by his grandparents. By the late 1950s, he has tried his hand as a soldier, thief, salesman, hunting guide, and farmhand. He's a jack of all trades, master of none. My name is John Hughes. I'm the director of the Butte Silver Bowl Public Archives. Butte, Montana has always considered itself to be somewhat uh, different. People say what evil did was uh, something that was so dangerous that uh, it's hard to comprehend. In his own mind, uh, it was probably dangerous, yes, but it was also glamorous. All that you can desire in life or want to be is what you can see immediately around you. And what I saw immediately around me in Butte, Montana was uh, a pimp with a shiny pair of shoes and a 49 Mercury. He uh, grew up in a tough neighborhood, I guess we all did in this town. He lived with his grandmother all his life. Everything that my grandparents got, they worked morning, noon, and night for it. Nothing was ever given to them and nothing was ever given to me. I either worked for it or stole it. I think it was mostly evil's intelligence and wit that made him famous. Butte, Montana is special like that. It's, it, it's a rare breed of people. It was like growing up in the Wild West. I used to say Evil Knievel was the Billy the Kid of the 20th century. He was basically an outlaw. They were raised as semi-outlaws. Fend for yourself, frontier justice, that whole theme. Well, there's a lot of stories about how Evil got the, the name Evil Knievel. I was on duty tonight with Officer Dell Brush that Bobby Knievel became Evil Knievel. What happened is Bill off of Knoffle was in this cell, and we put Bobby in this cell. Now we got Awful can awful and evil can evil. We're in for one hell of a night. One of the jobs that evil did before he got into Daredevils was um, he owned a Honda motorcycle dealership. And to promote the dealership, he went to parades and did wheelies. And this is a, a picture and a recreation of that original a wheelie show. And he saw a vision, something he could do, and he attracted a crowd and it turned into a business. <laughs> The business is stunt jumping. Knievel puts together a ragtag team, the Motorcycle Daredevils, with Evil Knievel getting star billing. His first jump was over a box of rattlesnakes, and uh, he actually didn't quite make it. Broke the box open, and the snakes went everywhere, and the crowd went crazy. And Knievel's next jump is in Indio, California, in January of 1966. It's an instant hit. Within weeks, he's booking repeat performances throughout the state and Midwest. But amongst some of his daredevil stunts, he's not so lucky. Over the next nine months, Knievel makes 12 jumps, each time over a growing number of cars. Of those 12, two result in accidents. But with the failed jumps, Knievel finds his niche, getting severely hurt and living to tell the tale. His confidence as a stunt jumper grows and grows. There's this kind of combination between Steve McQueen and the Daredevil motorcycle riding. He looks vaguely like Paul Newman. Newman is another actor who is associated with speed, car racing, that kind of stuff. 
When he finally puts on his red, white, and blue indelible Evil Knievel outfit, you've got Presley, you've got little bits of James Dean kind of vibing in there too. Knievel is trying to figure out how to turn his stunt jumping into big money. And the inspiration is Caesar's Palace. So we're at Caesar's Palace. The fountains that he jumped are in the background, but this property has been modified over the years. So in 1967, the hotel had only been open for a year. So the parking lot was much more open. And so my dad actually built a plywood takeoff ramp in the parking lot because you couldn't do any practice runs through here. So really, he was flying by the seat of his pants and just had to calculate by his experience how fast he needed to go. There was nothing really like Caesar's Palace anywhere else in the world. You know, keep in mind this is about 11 years after Disneyland opens. So the whole idea of that kind of theming was pretty new, and Jay just took that and ran with it. We we're going to have goddesses as our cocktail waitresses, and they're going to be wearing the toga dresses. And Jay had a very short attention span, you know, liked shiny things, liked good-looking women. That's what he wanted around him, so that's what he created at Caesar's Palace. And you just open it up and off you go. An evil stunt fits perfectly into Sarno's vision. Las Vegas plays a rather important role in Evil Knievel's uh, story. Uh, Vegas is always looking for new ways to push the envelope of attraction and entertainment. Vegas is not uh, a city that's ever been interested in restraint or subtlety. And so I think at that time, his Knievel's pitch probably seemed like a feel-safe. Good or bad, this is gonna make the headlines around the world, man. Everybody's gonna love it. Either the guy is going to do this or he's not gonna do it. Either way, I think people are gonna be interested. It is the largest audience the Montana County Fair stuntman has ever had. People from all over the country flock to Caesars in droves. If Knievel ever had doubts, it's too late now to turn back. He went when he felt the itch to go. It was a job for him and he wasn't gonna quit his job. He gave his word, he showed up, people paid for the tickets. And he always said he's not gonna give them their money back. He never backed out of a jump. And he just worked up his courage and went when he was ready to go. John Derrick was on the takeoff side. Linda Evans was on the landing side. And, and seriously, that crash is one of the greatest real pieces of sports film in history. Two seconds stretch to a gut-wrenching eternity that remains hard to watch. Knievel is rushed to the hospital in a coma. Vegas bookmakers are already betting he will not live. Now, the questions begin. What went wrong? This is Evil Knievel and the Evil Knievel shock-absorbing stunt cycle. You can make him do wheelies, backstands, and for that big jump, up and over that four-foot ditch. Evil Knievel sold separately or with the Evil Knievel stunt cycle from Ideal. The toys are what really made Evil Knievel rich. The jumps made a lot of money, but the enormous amount of money came from the contract with Ideal Toys, and specifically the stunt cycle. If you were a child in the 70s, even boy or girl, you remember it. Um, it was the hottest selling toy of that era. A pristine stunt cycle on eBay can go for over $1,000. It was the biggest selling toy in the history of the toy world. 
And actually, my dad made more money from that toy than anything. And when you think about it, like, they're, they're, back in those days, there wasn't products with people's names on them. I mean, my dad literally started the licensing business. At the time, no one was doing that. So, I mean, you look at what it's evolved into today, it's like everybody talks about their brand this and their brand that. That's what Evil Knievel started. January 1st, 1968. Evil Knievel is in critical condition after a devastating crash at Caesar's Palace, Las Vegas. Few expect him to survive. Can you watch? It's unstable. As he clings to life, questions begin about why he missed the landing. Knievel made his first distance jump only two years earlier, over two mountain lions and a box of rattlesnakes. That jump was 40 feet, and he fell and broke his ankles. Some wonder if Knievel was up for a longer jump in the first place. I think my dad was better at being a showman than he was at being a jumper. I don't think my dad started out to be any kind of stuntman. I mean, he, he was such a unique individual, he was born to be famous. He just had that kind of creativity and imagination and originality about him. And, 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 I mean, he found his fame on a motorcycle. It's often said that the true essence of courage is feeling fear, but doing it anyway. In that sense, he really was a courageous guy because he had a very realistic understanding that he was gonna break multiple bones in his body. And he did. I mean, he proved it to himself over and over again. He kept on breaking multiple bones in his body. And this is the fascinating thing about this guy. He had such a drive. And no fear. Typically, you do speed runs to get your the, the right amount of speed. But with Caesars, there was no speed runs. He had to speculate 100% on the speed. But at Caesars, he could only get speed, slow down, stop, go back down, and he just had to go for it. There was no other way around it. He couldn't do speed runs. He couldn't drive through the fountains. Despite his reputation for missing jumps, Knievel's success rate is impressive. It really is. Um, you know, he, he crashed 19 times out of 172 jumps. And people always say, well, that's a pretty good percentage, you know? But you start thinking about crash number one, crash number two, three, four, five, and you go to 19 crashes. And for somebody to get back up. And keep going after that many times. Uh, you know, that's why a lot of people admire the guy. In fact, Knievel's longest jump remains a world record for 20 years. His skill as a stunt jumper is unmatched to this day. Experts agree Knievel's crash at Caesars was not a failure of expertise or courage. Other factors need to be examined. Days after being admitted to the hospital, Knievel regains consciousness. Vegas Memorial, Mr. Pete. What happened? It's like a heck of a fall, Mr. Pete. I broke something, didn't I? Just about everything. He decides to create a story that he's still in a coma to keep public interest alive. Go on one piece, though. Wow. By now, the footage of his crash is on news broadcasts around the world. By nearly killing himself, he has finally found fame. But people still want to know what went wrong.
Triumph Knievel jumps on is an ordinary stock motorcycle, British made. The 650cc bike has no modifications for jumping. It was a, a racing motorcycle that he borrowed from a dealership in Southern California to make this jump. Not a special motorcycle at all, just a, just a stock Triumph motorcycle. Well, he started off on a Honda, a 250 Honda. So, so I guess a Triumph 650 was, <laughs> was better than the Honda. I, I suppose that's the way he thought about it. He was very successful with the Triumph. That was his favorite machine. He landed that machine all the time. Turns out the free bike is the right choice. Knievel's next bike looks impressive, but is a death trap. The American Eagle was kind of an infamous bike. Um, he only jumped 13 times. He crashed six of those times. So again, a bike that really was not made for jumping. And that bike's a nightmare. That is the worst thing he ever jumped. He crashed 50% of the time. 500 pound piece of junk. Close examination of the Caesars Palace jump shows that Triumph lands just short of the downslope, but straight as an arrow. Knievel himself praised the English bike for its perfect performance. The bike is not the problem. The cause of the crash remains a mystery. Evil man, you won't believe it. We're more famous than the Beatles. I'm telling you, Caesar's Palace has got bookings coming out of our ears, all because you crashed. More famous than Elvis. More famous than everybody. Evil Knievel's fame grows and grows as news of his crazy stunt and uncanny survival spreads across the globe. We should do this again, and this time, the crowds will be twice as big. We're gonna make a fortune again. Listen to me. Yeah. Uh, candy. Whoa! I want to jump the canyon. Sponsored by Caesar's Palace. We'll see. Knievel now sees the dollar signs he seeks. I can picture that, man. The Grand Canyon jump sponsored by... And I think what Sarnal underestimated was how much that would appeal to audiences around the world. Vegas, by the late 1960s, is very much trying to step into the next phase of its development, which is to kind of not just attract American high rollers, but to attract all of America to its pleasures. And he saw that the Knievel show was definitely going to be kind of a part of that. What was not anticipated was the extent to which the failure would also work in evil Knievel's favor. My dad used to say, look, I don't break my bones and spill my blood so that other people can make money. I do it so I can make money. And he loved being evil Knievel. So, you know, he was right in his sweet spot of what he wanted to, whoever he wanted to be in life, he was doing. And all the daredevils that I've met, when they crashed that bad, they never jumped again. That was what separated him from them. He got up immediately and said, I'm not done, I'm going forward. I want to jump the canyon. The Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon. I like it. I can picture that. The rest is, as they say, history. This desire to jump again is what makes Evil Knievel unique. Do it again. I'm telling you, we'll make a fortune. We fortune want a bigger make... crash. No, no, <laughs> this time you're going to land it. That's how Pain it and fear are your brain signals to you that you should not do something. Usually, People experience pain and fear, and they stop doing whatever it is that causes pain and fear. Evil Knievel was kind of the opposite. He seems to have gone towards the pain and fear, and he became such an icon because he seemed so completely oblivious to the pain and the fear that would have sent any normal, reasonable person running for the hills. What I see is a guy who was a really smart, savvy marketer and I think the marketing of his own image understanding of course the incredible visual appeal of what he was doing I think we're gonna have ourselves a deal whatever you want to say about about motorcycles flying through the air is it never fails to be interesting to watch now Knievel has the fame he needs to really strike it Evil Knievel famously holds the Guinness Book World Record for the most broken bones, and it all began at Caesar's Palace in 1967. So this is the uh, Caesar's helmet that hadn't been seen in public until it came out in the museum here this year. It's an iconic piece. 
The scratches are all from the pavement of the Caesars Palace parking lot. This was really one of his first full face helmets. So the first thing when you look at this helmet is just how the technology has come so far since the 60s for protection. And the fact that there's, there's scars on this thing going three different directions from the multiple times he hit his head on the, on the ground. It's amazing it survives. Decades later, the question still remains. Why did Knievel miss that jump? Mike Draper worked for Evil Knievel as a driver of his famous support transport truck, Big Red, in the years after Caesars, when Evil was at his most famous. Discovered in Florida in 2011, it has been perfectly restored at the Evil Knievel Museum in Topeka, Kansas. It was Knievel's home on wheels. Today, Big Red contains a vital piece of evidence from the 1967 jump. These are the ramps that they used out at Caesars Palace. Uh, oh, these are extremely heavy. They're all oak uh, uh, planks that's into there. I can't tell you how heavy each one of them is, but it's, uh, we've had some pretty big forklifts and it, it, he's used those ramps from the first time he started out at Caesars Palace and he's used them clear up to uh, when he retired. Same ramps. Throughout his career, Knievel kept these ramps at the same angle and installed them on sturdy support beams to keep them from moving when his motorcycle connected at 85 miles per hour. They were a trusted part of his act and never failed him in his entire career. Experts have wondered if the ramps were wet that day, but archival images indicate clear, dry conditions common in Nevada for December. There is no record of the winds or other conditions that could have thrown Knievel off course. Back then, it was... That's what several of his crew members told me. He'd, he'd lick your thumb and stick it in the air. He'd do a couple of pass-bys. That was it. And, he, and Evil would eyeball the ramp and go, okay. There was no radar. It was a huge gamble. Nowadays, you can scientifically plan out a jump to the T. And it's pretty safe but with a triumph or a heavy machine he was risking his life literally every single jump it was just guts and determination conditions were perfect the ramps were too fans and analysts rule out these external factors and look for other reasons for Knievel's spectacular crash Turkey, straight up. Part of the Knievel legend is that he had a shot of bourbon minutes before the stunt. He's in the casino, bets, I think he put a bet on red and roulette, I don't think he won. And then he does a shot of whiskey and comes out and does his jump. Knievel spoke out against narcotics his entire life, but swore by alcohol as a way to calm his nerves. So I kind of needed a crutch kind of to help me. Big Red's central feature is the bourbon only bar. Later in life, he admits that alcohol almost destroyed him. I think that I began to feel so bad from the alcohol hangovers that I really felt that I was beginning to lose touch with reality. Got on my knees and I asked God that he give me some help and that I could stop the drinking that I was doing. His son says the drinking problem started later, possibly linked to his multiple head injuries. You know, there's a lot of talk nowadays about concussion injuries. And I, I'm certain that that crash had a little bit to do with my dad's temperament later on in his life. I mean, that wasn't the only concussion he had. But back in 67, Knievel shows no signs of the alcoholism that would later plague his life. There is no historical record of his being drunk at Caesars or any of his jumps. That's not why he missed the ramp. But one final factor remains to be considered. Knievel's flaw is revealed in his most famous jump, in a rocket over Snake River Canyon. As soon as he can walk again, Knievel begins planning his next great stunt. 
he wants to jump the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon. The U.S. government authorities turn his relentless request down. Knievel makes 60 more jumps and has 10 more serious accidents. Here he comes. Then, in the summer of 1974, he announces his modified plan. I went to Idaho and I bought a canyon. It's my canyon. And on September the 8th, I'll jump it. And the only way they'll get me out of the air is to shoot me out with an anti-aircraft gun because I am going to go, believe me. Well, my dad used to tell me, he used to say, look, if they can put a man on the moon, they can figure out how to get me over the Snake River King. When you actually look at the sky cycle, though, I mean, it's, it's a tin can. Seriously. Where, where, where they're going to heat up steam and then they're going to blow it out the back of the rocket and it's going to make it all the way across the canyon. It, uh, when you see the rocket, people assume it's got a, a jet type engine in it, but this was steam. All there was in this was a, a canister that they filled full of water, heated it up to almost 500 degrees, and then basically pulled the plug and the thing took off at 300 mile an hour up the ramp. How did he think, or why did he think to jump over the Snake River Canyon? <laughs> who, who knows? He was going to make a lot of money and get more famous, and that's what drove him. Hell, who knows how a guy thinks of something like that? Knievel fires a second test shot. It, too, is a bust. The Snake River Canyon jump has been seven years in the making. Time and money are running out. You know, I fired two test shots to try and make the test shots go across the canyon. They both went right into the bottom of the canyon, right into the river. And I ran out of money and I only had one left. I had to get in and try it. Nobody ever has to say a prayer like I said when I punched that fire button. Four, three, two. I just said, God, take care of me. Here I come. One. Whoa, it looks like a good one. Whoa. Oh, evil, stay with the bird. He looks like he's... Whoa, there's been a mistake. He looks like he's going into the canyon. The ship's going down. It's, it's going down. As the vehicle is going down, the wind is blowing me back into the canyon wall. Uh, I'm fighting, trying to get out of it. People didn't realize it, but I was trying to cut myself free. I was tied in that thing. By some good fortune, the sky cycle manages to stay on the rocks. If that would have gone in the river, I would have absolutely drowned. I was a dead man. The evil Knievel now appears to be standing in the boat and waving. He's alive and well. He's okay. Of course, there was controversy over whether or not the chute that came out prematurely during the jump was deliberately pulled by Knievel, and of course, he said it wasn't, it was a malfunction. Sure, I mean, you could call it a stunt. A lot of people said it was a con. I said have a smile on your face. I don't smile at anybody. All right, get him out. Get him out. Out. Come on, get out of here. I think Evil felt like it was uh, a win for him, but... Uh, he thought he was going to die. I do not ask for your respect. I demand the truth, and that's the way it's going to be. Until I come back alive, and you can say whatever you want to. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. What it meant was that by this time, when Knievel had gone down, a lot of the world was ready to turn away. And I think you all know now, by looking at me, I wish that I didn't have to do this and I wasn't here. It made a lot of people feel for the first time that they might be getting scammed by this guy. And when that starts to seep through, that becomes very difficult to maintain the same level of popularity because people aren't trusting you in the same way anymore. 
Knievel's willingness to die for a stunt at Snake River sheds light on the recklessness that nearly killed him at Caesar's Palace. Evil didn't really feel a sense of control because he wasn't really in control. When he came off that ramp and knew that he probably wasn't going to land it, it was just a question of waiting for the impact. Should people do things that they know are going to be incredibly damaging? Sometimes we should listen to our fear. It's, it's trying to tell us something. Man. So people today get, make, make, make things so complicated. Like they build models and they have trajectories and, it, what, and they try and figure out how far they're going to jump and the weight of the motorcycle and physics. And uh, he didn't make the jump because he wasn't going fast enough. It's not complicated. <laughs> Experts conclude that he missed the jump at Caesars by being one mile an hour too slow. He just didn't have the data he needed to make the landing. But Knievel's uncanny fearlessness to jump at all that day is also his fatal flaw. I think Evil Knievel's genius wasn't understanding the physics, it was understanding the storytelling. He understood how the audience was going to react. As long as he understood that, he didn't need to understand the physics of landing. He knew that he was probably going to break many bombs. But he also knew he was going to make millions of dollars and he was going to become famous. To him, that was a win. Knievel's spectacular crash at Caesars was caused by a simple miscalculation of speed. He had 100% speculate on the speed, and he was one mile an hour off. But fate is a, plays a huge role in that. If he had landed it, people probably would have said, oh, I could do it. Knievel's fame continues to burn bright. He has four of the top 10 highest rated sports shows in history, including the number one most watched wide world of sports. I mean, that's the epitome of fame in the United States. They did a study of name recognition in the world, and, and the three most famous names were Elvis Presley, Evil Knievel, and Muhammad Ali. He dies with 14 pounds of metal in his body in 2007 at age 69. It's just a combination of everything he put his body through, kind of caught up with him. Today, Knievel's legend is stronger than ever. Evil Knievel is very much a man of our age, and we live in an age of complete reckless disregard for, for consequences. You know, he claims to be honest, straight shooter, a real common man. Thank you. He says he is who he is. We're gonna take him at his word. We'll buy it. Thank you very much. So we'll see if, how well his, his moment is going to endure. But uh, he definitely seems to be a man of our moment right now. There's just something about Evil Knievel. I mean, it, obviously, he's my dad and I love him. But he did things and he believed in himself with a strength of character that I've never seen or met in anyone else. And he was just so self-confident of, of who he was. I mean, he's still a human, he's not perfect, but he was, he was, he was really a, a great man.